Hi, I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, welcome to Season 5 of Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears featuring in-depth conversations with fascinating people from sport and politics, science and culture, business and beyond. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. You can also listen to old episodes. There's almost 200 in the back catalogue. Interested in great writing? Well, we've got you covered with episodes featuring Tim Winton, Julia Baird, Matthew Riley, or Richard Flanagan. Or you could just stay tuned today for a guest I'm really excited to welcome. In this episode, we speak with Nam Lee. It's no overstatement to say that Lee burst onto the literary scene in 2008 with the publication of his book of short stories, The Boat. The book was a publishing sensation, described as a singular masterpiece, winning every imaginable national award before being translated into 13 languages. But rather than take that cachet and write it into what would no doubt have been a best-selling sophomore effort, Lee somewhat disappeared. There was no follow-up book until now, really, 15 years later, returning to his great themes of identity and representation with a debut book of poetry, 36 Ways of Writing a Vietnamese Poem. I've actually been interested in interviewing Nam for the better part of a decade now, so it's a thrill to have him here in the studio at last for a chat. Welcome, Nam. Thank you very much, Conrad. I'm glad to be here. I'd love to just start at the beginning so that people who aren't familiar with your career get a sense of, of who you are. You were born in Vietnam in 1978, same year as me, uh, and came to Australia by boat as a refugee when you were less than a year old. You've spoken in the past about how the, the hard work and sacrifice of your parents inspires you more than anything else. So I was wondering if you can just speak to that a little and maybe explain what your childhood looked like in Melbourne. Yeah, um... I guess it was strange to me in the way that childhood is always strange, but also it's all you know, so it was all there was. But in a weird way, it was also strange, I guess, to the larger imaginary, whereas now, thinking and talking about it, it almost feels like a a very familiar, if not cliched, immigrant story. You know, <laughs> we, we, we rocked up, we were shopping at Vinnie's, St. Vinnie's and um, Salvo's and stuff, I've still got some photos of mum and dad wearing these like really rocking hipster sort of, you know, <laughs> flared trousers and um, tie-dye sort of blouses. And then they sort of just settled into a rhythm of extraordinary hard work. Like dad was working two, three jobs um, simultaneously. Mum was looking after us and working at the same time. We used every possible sideways dodgy form of childcare we could possibly imagine <laughs> like i think I, I i spent i spent days on on days um especially during holidays at the local libraries because you know you didn't have to pay to get in there they were warm they were sheltered people there you would assume were decent and nice and no one bothered you for the most part yeah so it was it was great and so we grew up in different places we sort of bounced around a bit and i went to primary school and sort of fell into, you know, the rhythm of suburban Doncaster in, in Melbourne. And from there, it was kind of just like, again, in some ways, the typical immigrant story of, you know, you need to focus on your education. Your education is, is it? That's, that's the entire sort of reason why all of this is happening. You know, our work, our move, um, our separation from family and culture and homeland so um, no pressure, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, get good grades. Well, you reacted quite well to that and, and did get good grades. You won a full scholarship to Melbourne Grammar, premier prizes there in English and literature, then a, a national scholarship to the University of Melbourne where you studied arts law, went on and graduated with honours in both. But after briefly practising corporate law, you, you turned away from a legal career. Firstly, why? And then second, how hard was that to broach with your parents who would have seen that, I assume, as the kind of end goal of all that hard work and education? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, for the record, I also got a PREMS award in um, biology, which I'm very Fantastic. proud of in year 11. So let the record Left state. Brain, right brain. Yeah, yeah, that's Excellent. right. Excellent. Double threat. And I got to say, I mean, it's, it's maybe not irrelevant to the conversation is, of course, my parents, as with a lot of immigrant parents, Asian parents in particular, really pushed us in the the harder you know stem side of things and so yes. i was i was very much you know pushed and 
enjoyed being pushed in maths and science and stuff as well. And part of that is because it's not as subjective or it's in some ways not subjective at all. And so, you know, if you know the answer, um, no one can say, yes, but, mm. you know, um, you're missing context or the tone's not there or the, the right. spirit's not there in the way that you would see in culture or um, in music, for example. You know, some of my peers would be marked down because this unsayable, indescribable sort of essence was missing. <laughs> and so, you know, you had none of that sort of wiffle waffle in maths and science. But it also made it hard for me to um, convince my parents that I really loved reading and writing um, and that I was kind of good at it. Mm -hmm. And I think they sort of um, played along, I think, for the, for the most part. And, and so when I, when I finally got my TR after year 12 and told them, you know, I want to do, do arts, it was unthinkable that I would do arts alone. So I had to sort of pair it with something. And my choice was arts law. And they went through a series of bribes where <laughs> they were like, well, you know, if you don't do med, okay, our concession is why don't you do med law? <laughs> 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 and there were some crazies that we'd heard of. I think in any given year, there were maybe, you know, half a dozen people who were nuts enough to do med law. Um, so I, I shot that down. And then after some more sort of soul searching and um, deep yielding on their part, they sort of came back and they said, look, okay, we've thought about it, we've talked about it, med arts it is. <laughs> and even that to me was, I'm sorry. I think part of it also was um, I hadn't really explained that arts wasn't fine arts. And so, yeah. you know, there was a sense that I would literally sort of just be, you know, scribbling my life away, you know, on pastels and charcoals. So I managed to get get that across. I probably used all of my social familial filial capital you know <laughs> accrued over 18 years to do arts law and then as you say um i don't regret it at all and i really i didn't do law as a placeholder i did law because i i wanted it i okay. wanted it in my toolbox i wanted to know how things worked i wanted to have a sense of um, empowerment i guess mm -hmm. um but when i was actually wearing the suit and doing the very very junior bottom of the barrel sort of stuff and going to work in the city in the Rialto I just realized every day compoundingly that that was not for me it was just not my my thing on on so many different levels which is not to say that law couldn't be at all but that certainly wasn't and so um, I applied kind of um, through a fluke to a program in the states and this is the Iowa Writers Workshop? That's right, yeah, it was in Iowa. And I've told this story before, but when I finally, you know, broached the topic with my parents and told them that I was I was quitting the law to to go to Iowa, I made sure to smudge my pronunciation of Iowa, which in Vietnamese sounds a lot like Hawa, which is how you would say Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh yeah, the the total mendacious red meat that I threw them was uh, um you know, you can tell your friends that I'm going to to Harvard and not you know, someplace in the Midwest. <laughs> um, you have a couple of brothers. I, I'm just wondering, I do, yeah. are you the eldest? Did you have that burden as well? No, I was I was the middle. Okay. And my my older brother, Trung, he was always meant to be the doctor. And he actually wanted to as well, or mm. so he says. And so he went through, he's three years older than me, and he went through um, school and then he ended up doing bloody com law. And so, <laughs> you know, the pressure just swung across to me and it felt mm. like okay would well, our, our hopes reside in you now you went to iowa and i believe that was um with the, working on a novel in mind this um this thing i've heard referred to as a 700 page coming of age story <laughs> set in melbourne one that you've <laughs> since described um this unpublished manuscript as a spectacular multi-dimensional failure that will never <laughs> see the light of day what, what went wrong Oh, mate, what didn't go wrong? <laughs> um, I had no idea how to, I mean, I still don't, but I had no idea how to write a novel. And I was only writing poetry and reading poetry that entire time. I was that, I was that insufferable guy. And so, so the story goes that I actually, I got, I got the gig at the law firm. I got them to write me a letter saying, we are going to employ this guy. I took it to, to the bank across the, across the road <laughs> at 91 Williams. And I sat down with them and I said, look, how much of a loan can I get to go traveling yeah. and 
coming back to this job, you know. They, they said, look, max, I think it was 15K. I then walk back to the, the firm and I say, I know we said that I'd start next year, but what about the year after? <laughs> <laughs> and so then I took that 15K and I was just, I, I took 12 months and did the, did the backpacking thing. And I'd done a bit of part-time work in the law at the time, so I, I already knew that was not for me. So there I am sort of, you know, in South America and I'm thinking, I need a way out, I need an exit strategy. And I haven't even entered yet. And mm. I'm, I'm, I'm trapped, I'm bound. And so I thought, I'm not going to get that exit strategy through poetry. I'll write a novel. You know, how hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've read some of these things. Um, you know, every, every second headline in the literary press was, so-and-so gets a big deal for this, you know, this and that. And I thought, okay, that could be sort of my, um, my springboard out of this. And then I can sort of swing back into what I want to do. And so I sat, I still remember this, I sat in a, a cafe in Quito, Ecuador, and it was one of those internet cafes. And I drafted the outline, 20 chapters worth of a novel in basically one day, in one sitting. And the ridiculous thing, Conrad, was over the many years that I worked on this thing since, I didn't realize that I was allowed to depart from <laughs> from, from that, uh, you know, that blueprint. And so I think if I had to sort of look back and say now, I'd say... In a sense, I was too hidebound and rigid. I knew that I needed to discipline myself to write this thing. And so I kind of rolled everything else into the discipline rather than letting certain things breathe and, you know, other things take unexpected directions. And so I was I was, I was was pushing and pushing and pressing because that's what I had read. You need to really push and press to write a novel. Mm. You need to um, not give yourself ways out. You need to sort of just like get it out there and then you can sort of muck around and revise and stuff and I did I tried to revise and streamline and cut and cull and um, you know rewrite the thing but it just it it wasn't it wasn't anywhere near good enough and so that's one of the great blessings of my career actually is that I never actually you know offered that on submission because I shudder to think <laughs> sounds like uh, to use a, a poker term like you're kind of pot committed yeah, in a yeah, way. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the boat your 2008 collection of short stories burst onto the book scene, as I said, in what one critic described as a literary shooting star. You were 29. Something, what, yeah. Like what that. kind of pressure comes with that sort of breakthrough and that sort of attention that you got? It was strange because, first of all, the book was never meant to be. It was a book of stories that I'd written during my MFA, the first versions of, of those stories. And then I was working on a novel. Mm. And the novel was meant to be what I was meant to be working on. My agent was expecting the novel. The plan was always, um, that's what we're going to go out with. And so I still remember, I, I, was, in, I was in Provincetown in winter um, in this very leaky barn on the top floor. That's in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. On the coast. Yeah, Lovely in Cape spot. Cod. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Winter, it clears out. No one's there. Everything's closed. And I was meant to be working on the novel and I kept on tinkering with the stories and so I thought you know you've only got seven months you've got to you've got to work so what I decided was I would take the time to get the stories to a place where I could sort of just let them go in a sense just you know put them in the cupboard and I did I I, I, I did the best most productive sort of stint of my life I reckon up there in that barn and finished the stories put them together in a word doc and emailed them to my agent and said, okay, don't let me look at this again. That's done. I'm going to be a good boy and work on the novel now. And it was honestly a surprise when he wrote back and he said, actually, I think this could work as a book. And so we, we sent it out and it, it was accepted. But the, the thinking at the time was very much novels are the, the only game in town. Mm. Um, stories aren't really read, aren't really taken, aren't published. If they are, they're always seen as a stepping stone or a sort of like a, you know, an apprentice work. So I had no expectation that this would be a book. And so that kind of gave a complexion to my experience. The whole thing was gravy. The whole thing was, <laughs> wow, it's going to be, it's going to be a book. It's going to be hardback. It's going to be in cloth covers. And then when it sort of struck a nerve and resonated, I didn't know that this was 
unusual. Like yeah. I just thought that this was how things happened, you know, and I was actually in the States at the time and, you know, I was traveling and going to bookstores and talking to people and I thought this was, this was what happened, you know, I'd be at Powell's in Portland, which is one of my favorite bookstores and I'd look at the calendar on the wall and every night there would be a reading of someone coming through. So uh, my, my sense was, you know, I'm part of this club now. It was, right. it was awesome. And it wasn't until a bit later that I realized that this was actually a really extraordinary thing that was happening to me. And then much, much later, looking back, I realized, oh, that was, it was kind of, it really was um, a blue moon kind of thing. And in a way, my not knowing that that was the case maybe saved me from allowed you to enjoy it yeah allowed me to enjoy it and allowed me to um to you know sort of go with a clear mind and heart onto the next things the stories in the boat introduce characters from iran japan colombia country victoria um led helen garner to call you a fearless new australian voice that accepts no geographical limits that was 15 years ago, however, and, and much has kind of changed in the literary world since that time. It's often really politically fraught mm. for writers to write in the voice of another culture or subculture or gender. I'm just curious, if the boat were published today, do you think anybody would care that you didn't grow up in Cartagena or um, or Tehran? Yeah, I reckon, I reckon they would. Yeah. I reckon the reception would be very different. My hope is that I would still be writing my interest and my truth wherever that led and not be cowed by you know the pieties or the the conventions of the time i think even then there was a sense for me that i had to just you know get the elbows out and just make space i had to continually you know create the permission for me to to do what i wanted to do and to sort of follow um my my passion and my risk i guess and that's something which looking back now has carried through my entire writing life you know i feel like we write as writers against and sometimes with so many expectations and conventions and orthodoxies um so many unspoken understandings as mm-hmm. well as to what's acceptable what will be rewarded what will be seen as being brave even though in fact it's entirely safe yep um you know the word transgressive or you know boundary breaking um is just blur bees now like it has no real meaning um so often because it's just advertising it's it's talking about things as a means to um presenting it as a product and then selling it and so so much of the way that my mind works was always, well, we've got to be, we've got to be honest about this. We've got to be clear about, you know, how this is working. Because, you know, in my view, all, all serious art has to grapple with the conditions of its making as well as its, its, its reception as well. And so, you know, what I was saying back then, I might say differently now, but I think the gist would be the same. And the gist would be that you can't write from a position of fear. You can't write from a posture of obeisance or sycophancy towards things. And the idea that that only certain people, because of the way that they look or where they were born or the language they speak, can write about certain things, to me is actually a reverse essentialism. It's saying that there is a sort of unified or coherent truth about that kind of person or that kind of yeah, culture. Yeah. And for me, culture is you know, it's dynamic, it's multifarious, it contains contradictions, it should contain contradictions. And if you if you rock up into a culture that doesn't allow for contradictions or different meanings, different intensities, different biases, then you're probably in a pretty effed up culture, you know. So I, I, I consider it a blessing and a responsibility to be open to the complexity and the largeness and difference of things. And I would say that that doesn't apply just to cultures and, and societies. I would say that applies to people too, because I don't know about you, but I don't feel that I'm a very consistent person in myself all the time. I think I have different impulses <clears throat> and voices, arguing, contending. I misremember things. I feel certain things emotionally that I don't feel intellectually sometimes and 
that changes, depends on our moods. Um, we are so assailable, like we, we can be so impressed upon by by everything, you know, by the people we're with, by what we hear on the radio, by a cloud going over the, the face of the sun. Like, why do we think that we're these solid and consistently conveyable things? That, that just seems nuts to me. Well said. I want to talk a little bit about what you've been doing since. I know, I know you were a fiction editor for Harvard Review. At, mm-hmm. at some points, you've lived in the The real US. Harvard, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, at some points, you've lived in the US, the UK, maybe France, Italy. That makes you sound a little bit itinerant, but yeah, I yeah. feel like you're much more closer to, to home now. But one of the most interesting things in the middle of that, when I had thought about profiling you back in the day for yeah. the Melbourne magazine was I came across this news item in 2014 suggesting that you were, in fact, a semi-professional poker player <laughs> on the Las Vegas circuit. Um, what did you enjoy about How did you come to that? And what did well, you enjoy about that? To, to to clear the air, I guess, on that, there was and is another Nam Lee who is a much more successful and, you know, skilled poker player. Right. <laughs> this is why I probably so gave there away was a- that line of inquiry. I was like, oh, it's not him. It's, yeah. it's not him. But I think a lot of the... Um, a lot of the the smudging was, you know, I was I was piggybacking in a way on his um, success. Like he was, you know, he's he's, he's a bit of a, a superstar on the scene. I was playing never professionally because um, that was also something that was reported that wasn't the case. But I was playing as first of all a hobby, mm-hmm. and I really enjoyed the game. I you know I've always loved games. I love um, all sorts of games, and poker to me was this amazing amalgam of you know left and right brain to be yeah. honest you know because in in, in, a, in a sense you know chess for example is a very sophisticated game people were sort of measuring the intelligence of computers using chess basically as the index of that but it is still a closed system like there are only x moves that are available to you at any given time and you're only working within a finite sort of structure of combinatorics whereas in poker you've got that mathematical side but the amount that you bet is is all possible like there are there are you know infinite gradations of that there's an enormous element of luck in what you know what cards you're dealt and what comes out in the middle and then there is this incredible psychological social aspect where you're dealing with people (laughs) and so for me, you know, the years that I was getting into it, because I, I have a, an obsessive sort of personality, and I get into things when I am interested in them, it was actually the perfect counterpoint to writing. So I would be writing, you know, pretty much every day. And then when I would rock up at the poker table, I felt like I was using my brain in a way that was not antithetical to writing because I was dealing with people. And mm-hmm. what else is writing but dealing with people often? But I was also, you know, doing this other thing that was scratching, you know, a different sort of itch and working a different muscle. And I got to say, you know, part of what retained its fascination for me was sitting down at a table um, because I only really like to play live and seeing those people around you. It was the true democratic forum of our times. I had never seen, I still haven't, I don't think, any other place, any other situation, any other forum where people from such disparate backgrounds come together and they are all equal mm-hmm. in the eyes of the cards. You know, you bring all of yourself, you bring your, your baggage, you bring your biases, you bring your bigotry and people use that against you. You know, if you have certain stereotypes about how a woman might play or an Asian player might play or... You know, there are all sorts of types and assumptions that are sort of like, you know, that, that swirl around that table. And at the same time, if a player outplays you, then a player has outplayed you. There's no sense of, oh, well, you know, that's because these other structures were in place or you don't have any excuses. You know, you're sort of no. just shorn. So, I, I, yeah, I, I really love that. And I, I regret, in a way, I regret, um, I sort of gave it up in 2016 when my first kid was born. 
um, partly because I just didn't have the edge anymore. You know, when you start thinking about the chips as money, yeah, yeah, um, that you know converts into food for uh, a little mouth. <laughs> you know, you lose your you lose your edge a little bit. Um, but I miss it. I do miss it a little bit. Well, I'm told you play in a somewhat regular game um, in Melbourne with uh, a good friend of Good Weekend Talks, Osman Faruqi, the uh, the host of the Drop. Oh, I should I should say that I I actually have never played with Osman, but I would we've we've tried to plan a game, <laughs> and uh, and life has interceded. So one of these days, Osman, I'll I'll, I'll get in. Oh, damn! I really wanted to know what kind of player he was. If he's the <laughs> kind of guy who wastes chips, chasing I reckon a, he would be a gut shot straight. Or, I reckon he would be the guy that you know you would you would you would play his ego. You know, <laughs> you know. Don't tell anyone this, obviously. But I reckon you could you could make him think that you were bluffing, and he would just follow you down every street. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your new book. I've I've read before, of course, that poetry was amongst your your first literary loves, and that being a poet might have even been the goal where you sort of permitted that um mm. here you are at 46 with a published collection how does that feel it feels what you know wild to be honest in part because i'm under contract for a novel and so when this happened when i when this book was finished and i looked at it and i thought oh yikes this this is a book and it's a book length poem but it's it's a it's the length of a book you know mm. i thought oh geez what do i do with this and not to get into it, but when I did send it to my agent and then considering sending it on from there, I did meet with a lot of resistance and I really had to fight for this book. And so I think how I feel about it now is I feel really lucky and I feel really solid in the choice that I made to publish this now um, at at some not insignificant risk. And it's because it's it's a book that I couldn't put off and it's a book that sort of speaks to where I am now. It's a book that returns me to first principles and it also puts all of my other work, both past and future, I would say, into a kind of sense and logic. Like I think it's almost like the, the, the explainer of how it is and why it is that I write. And frankly, one of the reasons why I haven't published in the years before now um it's not that i haven't written i've written like a lot of stuff it's just that i i needed to i needed to find something that really spoke to who i am and how i feel at the moment and it just felt to me like the stuff that i was reading of my own work um that i didn't publish it didn't feel like there was enough risk or truth there. I felt, it felt like I was fudging mm-hmm. maybe a little or I was skating a little and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tolerate that in, my, in myself. It does feel like a, a deeply personal sort of book. I was reading through it yesterday and I just noticed things that hinted war and deformity, rape, racial taunting, communism, capitalism, loss of identity. <laughs> um, there's all this vivid imagery, napalm and rice, moon yeah. faces and... Um, silky black hair i'm not really a poetry reader and i suspect that's because like a lot of people i just find it a little bit daunting worrying that i won't understand the meaning or the symbolism basically that i won't get it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like fine art so i asked you in advance to select um one from this collection to to read for us and then kind of walk us through yeah it um you've chosen number 25 Mm -hmm. grand gestural yep so i might just pass you your lovely book <coughs> cheers and and just before i get into that like i i totally agree with you i think poetry in the world of poetry um partly through its own fault and partly not has not done itself any favors i think there's been a sense that it's speaking to itself a bit too much i think there's been a sense that it's been used as a weapon almost between poets or between folks in you know academia and there's also a gamesmanship that often sort of comes into poetry which is meant to exclude because when something is used as a weapon or used to exclude it's the opposite of inviting it's sort of saying if you don't get this you're not worthy Mm. and also it's defensive it's saying if you don't get this it's not because i've done anything that's not up to par it's because of you you know you're not up to to par and i hate that I, i i i love poetry and i was brought to poetry because when I was reading it as a kid, you know, in those libraries, I was just 
totally walloped by the sense that these rhythms could actually enter your body mm. and thud you in that way. Like I, I, I couldn't conceive. I loved stories, but when the music and the musicality and the cadence and the rhythm sort of came into me, and then that led to like the you know the blooming of images that the poems would sort of give rise to. I just thought this is this is the most visceral um, and primary experience you could have. It shouldn't be a tertiary experience. You yeah, know, yeah. you shouldn't need a yeah. tertiary education to have this. Which is not to say that it shouldn't have levels and layers and and meanings. But if I had one hope, it would be for my poetry to do what the poetry that I love does, which it which is work on every level. You know, it's mental work to the casual reader who sort of just comes at it and um, gets the music of it or, you know, an image is struck or a memory is is kind of kindled. And it, hopefully it also works, you know, with people who have spent their life reading poetry mm. and can sort of say, oh, that's working in this this tradition and it's alluding to that and, you know, partaking in that conversation. So well, maybe it's come along at a good time. I mean, Evelyn Araluen's yeah. um, Drop Bear certainly broke through in a way that um, poetry books um, haven't in the past. So yeah. I, I wish it luck, but I'll, I'll right. enjoy your, your reading now. So this is um, uh, 25 Grand Gestural. Old man, sick man, dead man, holy, lotus soaked in gasoline. A struck match awakens the silence. Becomes one, bonds orange, skin lacquered black, amidst the beautiful gases. One with process. Fire like death. Not a thing, but a process. Its colours depending on how deep the breath. He neither moves nor speaks. No one now remembers why. His votive offering, his gift, not his life, nor his heart, which the reserve bank keeps, but the great gesture, stunning Plasmic, silent, blank. And this poem, this poem speaks to and describes an incident, an image that was once famous, um, which has now sort of become um, less familiar to people, of a Buddhist monk in Vietnam in um, 1963 who, in an act of protest, sat down in the middle of a busy intersection in Saigon, was doused with five gallons of gasoline, and then struck a match and burnt himself to death. And he sat there in a, in a you know, in a lotus position, and not once did he say anything, cry out, scream. No one knows when he died because there was no indication he just toppled over at one at one at one time and the interesting thing there are so many interesting things about this to me um some say it's the thing that actually brought americans into the vietnam war into vietnam um in a in a serious way i think jfk actually said that no other photo had had so much emotional impact and yet when when, when you ask anyone, even people who know about it, no one remembers why he did what he did. No one knows who he was protesting against. No, um, you're right. I have right? that familiarity with the story of but a you've got the image. immolating. You've got the image, the image in, the, in, in your head, right? But the knowledge behind it, yeah. no, I don't have anything. And I think that's really, I mean, it's, it speaks exactly to what we were just speaking about, which is that something can be pure symbol, can be so emotionally powerful, can communicate something in a really profound way and you don't necessarily need to have you know all of the ins and outs the encyclopedic sort of knowledge of the context of this was happening in this era against this corrupt despot and who was being played in other ways by the you know the other various forces that stuff is interesting and it can it can illuminate and add and sort of you know add sort of flesh to your knowledge but that doesn't take away at all from you know the the power of that particular image 
And it's also interesting to me because here is something that was intensely private, a man with his eyes closed, folded in, in himself, in the flame, folded in the flame. And yet there were 350 other bonzers, monks and nuns that actually came to this place. Journalists had been alerted, mm. so they knew to be there. And some of these monks were actually organized enough to to lie on the ground in front of police and um, you know fire engines that were coming in that, that could have doused the flame. And so what was intensely, you know, spiritual, transcendent, personal, powerful, was also stage-managed, performative, Hmm. um, and artificial in a certain way. And to me, that's not a contradiction at all. It doesn't take away from the power of the act. To me, it just adds to the complexity and the, the, the reflexivity of every moment, you know. And I think now, now that we're surrounded by by noise and, and, and colour and opinion and feeling, um, I think it's I think it's important to give ourselves a little bit of slack and understand that that stuff is still part of just how we are and who we are as well. Even if it is managed or performative or doesn't feel real or authentic, it's still part of who we are. And in that case, it's it's as authentic as it gets. Amazing. I have two more questions. I know we're pressed for time, but I want to get to them. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about another kind of writing. I understand that you've sort of contributed to several TV projects, working in the writers' rooms uh, on on productions by everyone from Alice Bell, who of course worked on The Slap, to Justin Kurzel of Snowtown fame. Um, what projects have you most enjoyed working on and do you enjoy that collaborative kind of writing as opposed to, you know, the the image of that the toiling <laughs> writer cloistered away by himself? No, yeah, 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 great question. I um it took me a little bit to to be won over, but I was won over because in some rooms, kind of like I guess if you're in a band or a choir or something, mm. when the meld occurs, it's kind of amazing, you right. know, like when when the, the, the sum is greater than, um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And there were times in some of these writers' rooms where we were working through and out things that I don't think any of us individually could have done. Um, so I think that, that, you know, there is definitely a place and um, um, an honour to, to that work. I'm still very, very much, though, a control freak about my own work and so I'm coming from a position of fighting for commas and semicolons and you know <laughs> the spacing has to be three spaces not four and etc so it's been a challenge for me to to come to come into and at that and I think it's it's been a really great education to be honest you know and I I, I do enjoy it it uses a different part of the brain as well because there is more plot and there is more story in most of the writers rooms that I've sort of been in and that stuff to me is really interesting as a kind of puzzle almost and something that needs to be solved in an an intelligent and surprising way and so much of what I'm trying to do in my poetry for example is not solve things is actually sort of open up deeper um, irresolutions and deeper um, insolubilities and so it doesn't really impede my writing um, in that way film is different to TV and different TV is different <laughs> obviously as well but I've really I, I, I couldn't say to be honest like I've really enjoyed sort of working on all sorts of different projects just because they come with their different imperatives and you know you've just got to work out where is the life in in this thing how do we honor the genre or the tradition that we're working in because we need to respect the viewers who who have certain expectations but how do we keep this interesting to ourselves as well and not just reach for the the bottom of the shelf every time we're looking for you know a, a character or a trope or a line of dialogue excellent what one last question it feels like an unfair one to ask a writer um what's coming next but particularly when they haven't even quite pushed their 
latest yeah, yeah. project out into the doing? world. It's totally unfair, but My at the risk God. of offending, once this tour does um, die down, what what will be next for you? Will we will we wait another fifteen years for another shooting star? Or? I I think for sure not because I feel like I've backlogged a fair bit. Um, I've I've got I've got a lot of poems that are done and some of which are published, which um, I would love to have the opportunity to collect and um, put forward. So, you know, that's in the cards, although I think my publishers would like me to maybe prioritise the novel before that. And it so happens that I too would love to get this novel, you know, off the <laughs> off the table and off my chest. Um, so I'm excited about that. Like I've, I've been in a really good place um, with that. I think this book has actually helped, to be honest. This book mm. has has kind of allowed me um, to tune into certain frequencies that I was finding hard to reach before. And it, it also has, like we were saying, it's kind of, it's it's throat cleared a little bit and carved out some space so that I feel more freedom to keep on writing on the novel. So that's good. And then I'm working on um, a bunch of other stuff actually as well. So yeah, hopefully I'll talk to you before uh, 15 years. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, <laughs> listeners, if you'd like to see Namley present his work in person, he will be appearing um, at the Melbourne Writers Festival on Saturday, May 11, and then at the Sydney Writers Festival on Friday, May 24. So put those down in your calendars. And Nam, I, I waited years to meet you. You didn't <laughs> disappoint. So thanks so much for coming in to chat with Good Weekend I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, mate. Cheers. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Margaret Gordon. Technical assistance from Cormac Lally. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. Ruby Schwartz is head of podcasting. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend.